Namaste. <laughs> so my name is uh, Giyuk Shin. Uh, I'm director of the Schoenstein uh, Asia Pacific uh, Research Center at Stanford University. Uh, it's my real pleasure uh, to welcome you to our inaugural event in New Delhi in collaboration with uh, Brookings India. Uh, as you may know, <coughs> I grew up uh, in Korea and I've been to you know, Asia you know, many times. I come to Asia maybe four to six times a year these days. But it's my very first trip to India, uh, so I'm very happy uh, to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, our center is uh, Stanford's university institution that focuses on uh, interdisciplinary study of contemporary Asia. Uh, our mission uh, is to promote a dialogue on key issues uh, affecting uh, Asia Pacific region uh, from social transition to development uh, to US Asia relations and uh, regional cooperation. For a number of years, uh, we have led a South Asia initiative uh, at the center, uh, inspiring many conference and publication uh, regarding the nations of South Asia and relations with the United States. So we are uh, trying to restart uh, this initiative, and we are very happy to be here today uh, with Brookings India to spark conversation on India and those East Asian uh, nations. Uh, actually, we have had uh, long-standing uh, relations with the Brookings uh, Institution. Actually, my colleague, uh, Ambassador uh, Michael Amakost, uh, he was president of the Brookings Institution uh, before joining our center, I think like well, early 2000. So I'm very happy to get work again with uh, Brookings India uh, this time. And as you know, the Asia Pacific region is quickly becoming the economic engine uh, of the world, and India especially is a net contributor to this as the area's largest uh, democracy and plays a, a rising role in uh, important sectors uh, of growth. Okay, today uh, our topic uh, is about uh, India and Northeast Asia, and you know this will be a great opportunity uh, for our dialogue. I mean, we are here not only to share our views but also uh, to learn uh, from you uh, in the audience uh, as well. You know, India has experience uh, similar to okay, those of many Northeast Asian uh, countries. Uh, extensive migration of people from rural to urban areas is happening in China. And Japan is dealing with a rapidly aging uh, population. And South Korea is ushering uh, in a multicultural you know, workforce into uh, this uh, historically homogeneous uh, society. And as I say more later, uh, you know, India is becoming uh, more and more important uh, for Korean uh, economy. So these, among other trends, bring about immense impetus for knowledge and idea exchange, uh, something both our center and Brookings India uh, hope to uh, facilitate. Uh, this morning, I was very happy to find uh, in a California light weather uh, in, in Delhi. <laughs> so I feel very comfortable uh, you know, coming to uh, Delhi this time. And uh, I sincerely hope that uh, every one of you finds today's discussion informative and enjoyable. And now let me turn to Mr. Uh, Bikuram Mehta, the Executive Chairman of Brookings India who will be introducing the panel and moderating uh, the discussion. So once again, thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm, I'm greatly honored to be invited to moderate this. Uh, I have to start by saying that uh, 
This is not a subject of my, uh, on, on which I claim to have any expertise. It's a subject I have great interest in, but I haven't studied it in great depth. And I have to acknowledge that limitation only because this is an extraordinarily distinguished panel, um, as, as you will soon realize when I introduce them. But what struck me was the fact that uh, we are having this conference at a uh, very propitious time. Um, there are many reasons why I think the timing of this particular uh, conversation is, 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 is correct or propitious. Um, we have leaders in, in India, in China, in, in Japan, and if you want to stretch it, Indonesia, who are all uh, uh, who are pragmatists, who are reform-minded, who are looking to focus on development. There's a commonality of interest here. It's not. A, I think it's. This is a, a, a coincidence, but it's a propitious coincidence. Um, certainly, our prime minister, uh, from where I sit, has greater admiration for the East Asian model of economic development than any other. He is a right of center economist or right of center <coughs> uh, ideologically. But he's not a Margaret Thatcher. He's more in, in, the, in the style of Lee Kuan Yew. He's more involved with uh, or interested in state-directed capitalism. Um, and uh, this is, uh, 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 again, something that um, has been manifest in his approach to the Northeast uh, Asian countries. Uh, as you know, he visited China four times when he was uh, the chief minister of of Gujarat. And more recently, of course, he's, he's not only been to Japan, and, but also welcomed uh, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping uh, to Gujarat. Um, the fact is that uh, the, uh, the India's relations with, the, with our Northeastern Asian, Northeast Asian neighbors has been and is a very strong economic relationship. It's a relationship that is built on a synergy of, of, of economic interests. Um, China is our strongest trading partner, albeit there's an imbalance in that relationship. China s sells more to us, significantly more to us than we sell to them. Um, Japan, well, China, uh, the Japanese have recently committed to, to um, uh, invest $35 billion over a period of of seven years, uh, China has committed to invest $20 billion, which is much lower than what was originally thought of, uh, 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 of, which was much lower than what was claimed would be their intent, but that was $100 billion. But it is a significant multiple of what has been invested by China in India. Uh, the number that I'm told of Chinese investments in India are is $400 million. So. If indeed the Chinese get to $20 billion, it's, a, as I say, a significant hike in their level of interest. Um, the, North Kore the, the Koreans, the South Koreans, I mean, they, they have uh, 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 probably the largest uh, presence in India. Uh, their investments to date are $3.5 or $3.75 billion. This is the number that I picked up when, I, when a colleague, of, well, my colleague of mine Googled and found that number for me. I may be wrong, <laughs> but uh, let me just put it across. Um, but it's, it's larger than what the Chinese have, and it's certainly larger than what the Japanese have. No, it's but not. The, no, it's not. It's Japanese, not, $15 billion. 15, so sorry. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly one, I was, uh, maybe uh, it's larger because the, the POSCO Post investments of, of, of uh, Korea of $12 billion have not yet taken, yes. you know, hasn't really materialized, but it is something that is sometimes put on the, on the table as, as a statement of intent. And the POSCOs have, POSCO has received, I think, all the approvals. So there is, anyway, the point I'm making is that the Koreans have a very substantive uh, investment in, in India. And that, so there is an economic relationship uh, between India and China, India and Japan, India and Korea, which is substantive. There is a civilizational connect, which we all know about. Uh, we have a long, old, we have old civilizations, the religion that's, you know, that the, that the Northeast countries, Northeast Asian countries are, uh, follow, have all been in some senses founded in India, Hinduism and Buddhism. 
So there is that connect. But having said this, of course, there are political issues, there are security and strategic issues. And what I find, at least when I reflect on the relationship with these countries, is that there's been a neat decoupling uh, of the economic uh, from the strategic and, and, and the, and the and security. So when the president of China was here, there was an incident on the border, um, and it certainly led to the Prime Minister of India uh, responding in a very muscular way, and understandably so. Uh, but I don't think uh, there's been uh, a, a ramification or an adverse ramification on the Chinese economic interests in, 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 in India, or at least the plans to invest in India. So there is this, there are these uh, economic interests, and then there is the strategic, which to some extent remain decoupled. But this is a question that perhaps could be debated uh, more in greater depth uh, when we get into the conversation. Finally, there's the issue of the United States, of course. Um, we talk about, um, uh, it's not just India and China, India and Japan, India and Korea. It, it, the US is, is a player. And I have never really understood the word pivot. Um, I have, uh, I've, I've read about it and I've tried to explain it to myself, but I've never really fully understood it. And I'm going to certainly ask my colleagues on this uh, panel to explain what the president had in mind when he talked about p pivot. Was it a cultural pivot? Was it a military pivot? Was it directed against China? Was it indeed something that had to happen because the Chinese needed to be contained, you know, in view of all that they were doing in the South China Seas? But the fact is that to some extent India's relationship with uh, with the U.S. has been influenced or could be influenced or might be influenced by India's relationship with China and vice versa. So that is an issue that we need to talk about. And then there are sort of subjects like, I mean, or issues like Afghanistan. Um, we have a former ambassador, U.S. ambassador of Afghanistan here, so I have to put that word on the on, on this table. But the fact is I think China and India have a common interest in the stability of, of Afghanistan. Is that the case? Is that going to be the bridge that, that might indeed bring us closer together? Uh, could that lead to a coupling of economic and strategic interests? Who knows? So again, that's a question that I think might be worth, uh, worth, worth presenting. But these are just sort of thoughts that, that um, a dilettante on the subject uh, you know, has. It's, it's a subject that I haven't really thought deeply enough about. I have these thoughts, and I place them in front of you because I've been given this honor of, being, uh, of, 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 of moderating the session. But having said all this, let me now actually request uh, um, the experts. And uh, I'm going to change the order a little bit. I'm going to ask uh, General Eikenberry perhaps to, to kick off. Um, I mean, frankly, none of the people on this panel, except myself and maybe you, the WPS, need an introduction. But, <laughs> but I will nevertheless give it. General Eikenberry was uh, was uh, you know uh, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan for three years, or oh, two years, from May 2009 to July 2011. And prior to that, he had a very distinguished career with the uh, with the U.S. Army. He was at one point also. <coughs> the general in charge of the coalition forces in Afghanistan. He's currently the William Perry Fellow uh, in International Security at the Center. That's uh, directed by uh, Professor Wukshin. And um, General, would you perhaps uh, talk about US, China, India, bring it all together, and maybe if you want to throw in Afghanistan, that would be very interesting. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Mehta, and uh, I also wanted to thank Brookings in uh, India and uh, recognize our charge here in uh, India, our APARC friend and uh, former colleague uh, Kathleen Stevens. Uh, so the topic that uh, we're to talk about this afternoon is India and Northeast Asia, but I did think it would be useful uh, to start off with providing more of a geopolitical context for uh, India, China, and the United States in the Asia-Pacific region and, of course, the uh, Indian Ocean, and trying to understand uh, the interest of India, China, and the United States in any sub-region, it's necessary to understand the broader regional context and, uh, indeed, with uh, these three powers, the global context. So that's what I'd like to uh, do.
And I'd like to look at the possibilities then for uh, divergence and convergence of interest and possibilities for cooperation or for confrontation in three different areas. One would be economic exchange. Uh, the second would be dealing with traditional interstate security issues. And the third would be countering transnational or unconventional threats. And Chairman Mehta, you've set this up uh, very well with your uh, excellent introductory remarks. First, let's talk about uh, economic exchange. What, what is very striking, and Chairman Mehta mentioned this, was the degree to which the three states, India, China, and the United States, are placing a premium on economic growth in their national security strategies. And uh, while this is true, though, it's interesting to look at the particular motivations for each country in doing so, because they're by no means identical. And this becomes important if we look to look then at convergence and divergence. For India, at least under Prime Minister Modi, the primary goal seems to be uh, poverty elimination and the creation of a strong middle class. But that's instrumental to him as he laments the fact that India today still has 30% of the population living in poverty, where he sees wealth generation as a moral imperative, but he also sees it as essential if India is going to emerge as a great world power. And then for the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, continued economic growth for them is necessary for their nation to resume its historical greatness, which it's enjoyed in the past. Uh, but it's also important to remember that it's essential to the Chinese Communist Party leaders if they're to hold on to their monopolistic gri uh, grip of political power. And if they should fail at this task over an extended period of time, then the Chinese people will question the party's right to rule. And Hence, for China's political elite then, economic growth is absolutely the key to their survival. For the United States, uh, for us, there's growing concern that we're losing our international standing as a result of economic problems associated with our mounting debt and inadequate investments in education, infrastructure, research, and development. So there is a strong incentive in all three capitals to focus on economic growth, and this is evident from the tremendous emphasis in the case of India that Prime Minister Modi has placed on bilateral trade and investment during his foreign travels and when hosting foreign visitors thus far to India. And if you want uh, any validation of this, then just look at the details from the Prime Minister's office, press releases after his meetings with President Obama, with President Xi Jinping, and with Prime Minister Abe. Beijing's prioritization on economic growth is clearly articulated in Chinese defense white papers over the past decade. And for the United States, our emphasis on economic growth is made very explicit in our own national security strategy in President Obama's 2012 defense strategic guidance. So given all of this, it's obvious that China the United States and India all prioritize trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific region and why they do so. The ASEAN plus three, China, Korea, and Japan, the to their total of world GDP grew from 19% in 2005 to 26% in 2014. That's an extraordinary growth. Of GDP measured in purchasing power parity now, the Asia-Pacific states, that counts the United States, count for the four largest economies of the world. And Asia, since the 2007 global economic fiscal crisis, has been the engine of global economic growth, notwithstanding, though, a somewhat lackluster performance over that period of time by Japan. So America's so-called rebalance to Asia, then, I didn't use the word uh, pivot, Chairman uh, Meta. I said rebalance, uh, should in part be seen in this light as specifically with our pursuit of TTP, as well as the bilateral investment treaty with China. China's likewise aggressively promoted its own business interest in this region, having put into effect in 2010 its free trade agreement with ASEAN and had great success in that area. 
and still vigorously negotiating a China-Korea-Japan freeway free trade agreement. India, for its part, has for some years now implemented its Look East policy that has an important economic dimension to it, looking at ASEAN. And just three months ago, it was not at all coincidental that Prime Minister Modi made his first trip to the United States via Tokyo. So with all three of these nations then committed to vibrant economic growth as one of their key pillars of a national security strategy, there would seem to be possibilities for cooperation and positive exchange, especially in terms of foreign direct investment and collaboration aimed at strengthening international economic institutions that advance liberal open economic orders. But there's many constraints in this area as well. China and India's economy, while offering very huge internal markets, are not necessarily complementary in terms of bilateral exchange and are highly competitive with respect to comparative advantages in international markets. And two-way trade between the three states right now is highly skewed in the direction of Sino-American ex uh, exchange. Although Indian and U.S. trade volume has expanded fivefold since the year 2001, it still represents just one-tenth the level of U.S.-China trade. And indeed, China, India itself is only China's seventh largest trading partner, and that places it behind the Netherlands. Though there's potential, of course, for considerable growth in this area should India's middle class continue to increase as it has in size over the past decade. China is uh, Japan's largest source of exports and imports, and India does not even appear on Tokyo's list of top 10 traders. Like Japan, South Korea's the number one trading partner is China. India is the eighth largest export destination, about one-twelfth the size of Seoul's China market and about one-fifth the size of, America, of its American market. And like uh, with Japan, it's not on Seoul's top 10 list. Also, to the extent that the number of students enrolled in higher education studies in a particular foreign country presage stronger future economic interaction between the sending and the receiving uh, states, India has 10 times as many students studying in the United States as they do in China, but it's still, the PRC today has 2.7 times the amount of students studying in the United States as does India. So I, pr I provide all of this data not uh, to suggest that India, China, and the United States can't find ways to cooperatively uh, construct positive sum economic gains, but I do mention this to make clear that there's some huge existing econ economic imbalances and asymmetries, and I think the consequences of these will be more pronounced should the global economy enter a period of protracted slow growth or recession. Second, more briefly, let me talk about interstate security issues. The dominant security factor, strategic factor, in the Asia-Pacific region is the rapid growth of Chinese power. And this is of concern not only to the United States and to India, but also to most states in East Asia, especially Japan, and several ASEAN countries to illustrate the scope of the Chinese rise. Chinese military spending was under $10 billion U.S. dollars in 1990. Last year it was $112 billion and it's now only behind that of the United States and it's accounting for 7.2 percent of total global GDP military expenditures. Compared with China's $112 billion a year military budget, India's most recent defense budget was $52 billion, Japan's $51 billion, and the Republic of Korea, $31 billion. What capabilities the People's Liberation Army of China seeks to acquire, and over what time frame, and to what end remain unanswered questions and the source of considerable disquiet in Washington and many Asian capitals. China's been increasingly assertive, beginning in 2010, in enforcing very far-reaching maritime claims and seeks to reduce the military predominance 
in the Western Pacific that the United States has enjoyed since the end of the Second World War. Beijing's ambiguity regarding its interpretation of freedom of navigation in the vast waters that it claims jurisdiction over today is also of concern to all nations that are heavily invested in the considerable amount of commerce that passes through the South China Sea, to include India. <coughs> China has also begun to invest in a network of ports, the so-called String of Pearls, that would permit it to defend its sea lines of communication from the Gulf of Aden to Malacca, and to eventually maintain a permanent naval presence in the Indian Ocean. And all of this, of course, is con of concern to India. Beginning with the Indian Ocean, India's most recent Ministry of Defense report noted that as maritime security issues gain greater urgency and relevance, power rivalries in the Indian Ocean region will need to be closely monitored as India's strategic stakes in the region are of critical significance to its security calculus. But India, like other nations, is also carefully watching PRC behavior in the East and the South China Sea. And this concern over Chinese intentions in the maritime domain has been reflected in New Delhi's emphasis on security cooperation with key partner states. So while India's foreign policy is now dominated by economic diplomacy, the security dimension is also evident. So when Prime Minister Modi met with Prime Minister Abe in September in Tokyo, the two leaders publicly declared wide-ranging shared interest in the security of the maritime and the cyber domains. Their stated desire, they stated a desire to work with each other and with like-minded partners to preserve the integrity and inviolability of the global commons, and they affirm their shared commitments to maritime security, freedom of navigation, and overflight, unimpeded lawful commerce, and peaceful settlements of dispute in accordance with international law. There's no question who the unnamed country was that this was referring to. After meeting with President Obama in Washington, the U.S. and Indian governments, they express their concern about rising tensions over maritime territorial disputes. They affirm the importance of safeguarding maritime security and ensuring freedom of navigation and overflight throughout the region, especially at that in the South China Sea. After meeting with his Vietnamese counterpart in late October of this year, Prime Minister Modi said that the Indian-Vietnamese partnership is important in promoting the two nations' prosperity and essential for advancing peace and stability in the region. He noted again shared interest in maritime security, including freedom of navigation and commerce and peaceful settlement of maritime disputes. He went on to say that the Indian government remains committed to the modernization of Vietnamese defense and security forces and extended a $100 million line of credit to enable Vietnam to acquire naval vessels from India. Now added to India's traditional security concerns with China are both its unresolved border disputes and recent PLA provocative actions along the line of actual control and, milita and the military dimension of Beijing's special relationship with Islamabad. So as China claims that the U.S. is attempting to contain it, India can also point to evidence of the same by China against them. And third and last, regarding transnational and unconventional threats, here there's more obvious possibilities for cooperation between India, the U.S., and China. Most prominent among these opportunities is in combating terrorism. So with the rise of a global jihadist movement aiming to establish transnational caliphates that are now menacing uh, in their form, and uh, part of their claim is to reclaim historic Islamic lands, as they say, that were later taken back by infidels. And these parts, and these include parts of India, and they include Xinjiang province in northwest China. So these movements do have the attention of New Delhi, Washington, and Beijing alike. And in fact, recent developments may lead Beijing to reconsider the nature of its relationship with the Pakistan that continues 
part by design, part by neglect, and part by lack of capacity to serve as a sanctuary for those practicing the most violent forms of theocratic Islam. Bilateral and trilateral cooperation between the India, the United States, and China in responding to Islamic terrorism could have both great symbolic and substantive value. And there's possibilities there for cooperation inside of Afghanistan as well. Uh, there's other transnational threats that do open possibilities for collaborative approaches between our countries. These include counter piracy, most especially in the areas of intelligence sharing and law enforcement. But still, there's the question of spheres of influence. And with the China, with Chinese offer, I would expect to provide a naval presence in, say, troubled waters in the Indian Ocean, much less welcome in New Delhi than, say, Beijing sending a task force to the Gulf of Guinea off of Nigeria. Nuclear arms control and preventing nuclear proliferation and their means of delivery through cooperation here is limited by China's desire to close the strategic nuclear gap with the United States and India's de desire to do the same with the People's Republic of China. As well, China's special relationship with Pakistan complicates matters. But still, the United States and India and China do have a strong common interest in preventing further expansion of the world's nuclear club membership. And for this reason, together, want to contain North Korea's program and preclude Iran from acquiring the bomb. There's also other opportunities for cooperation in the areas of combating transnational crime, including cybercrime, but even here, the blurring between criminal activity and state-sponsored economic and military espionage and spying place a huge constraint on possibilities. So to summarize, the India, the United States, and China all have explicit national security strategies that stress domestic economic growth, and accordingly place great emphasis on maintaining the global and Asia-Pacific regional stability needed to achieve their goals. They also recognize the importance of the commercial value of the markets of the other two nations, as well especially of those of Northeast and Southeast Asia in realizing their objectives, those, though India's potential has yet to be realized. There's also the possibility, though, that zero-sum game economic competition may emerge among these states using offers of investment and foreign assistance as a means to deny their rivals access and influence. We see this to some extent today in competition between Japan and China in Southeast Asia. On the other hand, there is still a significant divergence of security interests between China on the one side and the United States and India on the other with India's concerns most convergent with those of the United States in the maritime domains of Southeast Asia and stretching into the South China Sea, and perhaps with Beijing's perceived unwillingness to use its capital to persuade Pakistan to unequivocally abandon its support of various Islamic terrorist groups. There are possibilities for cooperation in the areas of unconventional threats such as terrorism, but it's not clear that this will be sufficient even together with the hope for increased economic interdependency to mitigate the security dilemmas that are inevitably resulting as a conjunction of, of a status quo America undergoing a period of strategic retrenchment, the rapid rise of a non-democratic China, which has a peculiar mix of being an international rising power and yet being a domestic, paranoid status quo power, and three, a democratic India, whose likely continued rise will lead to the generation of increased power, which in turn will beget new interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Eikenberg. Um, just a, a very short uh, question, and then I'll move on to the other speaker. Uh, you touched on transnational uh, issues and in particular terrorism. But I just wanted to ask you if, if you felt that the the ISIS threat uh, was isolated 
and limit it perhaps just to the Middle East, or do you see this as sort of a malignant tumor that's going to infect relationships between, you know, in the Northeast and between the neighbors, Northeast Asian neighbors, the ISIS? Yeah, I, I mean, I, just a quick. Uh, Briefly, Chairman, but I, I believe that the rise of uh, ISIS has focused the attention more of Washington, D.C., and Beijing, and uh, New Delhi, and does provide opportunities for increased uh, cooperation. We're certainly seeing that with regard to United States policy in Afghanistan. If you had asked me two years ago, would uh, the United States be willing to take uh, some risk with further drawdowns in Afghanistan and before the emergence of ISIS, I would have said the answer would be yes. But now you see that Washington's policy is one where they're willing to invest more into our security assistance to Afghanistan. The rules of engagement have been changed. So this fear about ISIS as a phenomena spreading uh, and spreading uh, into Pakistan, spreading into Afghanistan, the Chinese fear about what would the consequences be for Xinjiang. I think it's, uh, it's uh, providing opportunity for collaboration and cooperation among the great powers. But is there any evidence that we are actually working towards realizing that opportunity? I think that uh, if I look at uh, Afghanistan at the level of uh, dialogue, uh, that's going on there now, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we may come back to that. So, um, may I introduce uh, Ambassador Amakost, um, who is a distinguished fellow at the, at the Asia Pacific Research Center. He uh, has held several very distinguished positions, including uh, ambassador of the Philippines from 1982 to 84. He was under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 1984 to 1989. And then uh, before he joined, the most important job of his, the Brookings Institute as the president, he was the ambassador to Japan. So uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, a colleague, I'd still say, <laughs> and uh, Ambassador Amakost. He's going to speak on Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have to do something here? Yeah, you done it. Um, first, it's a great pleasure to be uh, participating in the program alongside a Brooking colleague again. I had seven of the most pleasant of my professional years uh, at Brookings Institution. When I left, I was convinced that uh, while Brookings was nearly 100 years old, it was one of the relatively few institutions in the U.S which you could confidently expect would be a big player a hundred years from now. And I'm delighted to be out here at the uh, center in India. We have one in, uh, in China and one in Doha. Uh, it's, it's going to be a player internationally as well, a much larger player than I envisaged in my years. I wish I'd been had the wit as Joe Talbot has to internationalize the institution. I want to speak uh, very briefly about how the India relationship looks if you're in Tokyo and particularly under Prime Minister Abe. Uh, he came to power, as you know, a couple of years ago at a time when Japan had been stagnating economically for more than two decades. And he uh, brought hope that he had a formula for changing that, and partly through traditional instruments like monetary and fiscal policy, and partly because he seemed to have the courage to step up to structural reform issues. He's done, I think, a lot on the first two. He's done a little in terms of specifying the areas in which he hopes to move on structural reform. Those have been postponed. They're a lot harder. And of course, he's immediately preoccupied with an election. But that may give him more time with which to address the other issue. When Mr. Abe looks at India, it seems to me what he sees broadly is a rather trouble-free relationship. But it's not just the absence of trouble that I think is impressive to uh, Japan, it's the opportunities which exist for shaping a really gigantic relationship. And in the economic sphere, uh, what they see is a huge country, a growing middle class, a sophisticated labor, labor force, and a need for capital flows and technological prowess, which Japan has in abundance. So it's the complementarity of uh, those economies and the growing economic interdependence 
that is impressive, I think, to the, to the Japanese. It isn't, as Carol has said, one of the biggest trade relationships Japan has, but it's a solid trading relationship and it's growing. The flows of foreign direct investment from the private sector are growing and they're, they're scheduled to double over the next five years. As Vikram said, uh, from the government standpoint, this is the biggest uh, recipient of Japanese official development assistance and there's a pledge for 35 billion additional dollars in projects, heavily focused on transportation, uh, renewal of railways, industrial <coughs> corridor infrastructure and so forth. So it's a gigantic relationship that's destined to grow and to become important at a very critical time in Japan's economic evolution. The second, uh, Mr. Abe came at a time when security policy, uh, he, was, he was committed to change. Now that has been occurring in an incremental way since the end of the Cold War. Japan outsourced a lot of its security policy to us during the Cold War. So we took care of the over-the-horizon security problems, and if we asked for compensation, it was uh, paid in the form of additional financial support for U.S. troops stationed in Japan. But I think uh, today, Japan has been uh, impelled toward a more ambitious security strategy by three factors. One is the greater sense of anxiety about China because its power has grown, its assertiveness has increased, and among many Japanese, there's a palpable sense of uh, danger that's focused on this territorial issue in the East China Sea. Second, I think Americans cannot deny that there is in Japan a greater anxiety about the reliability of the U.S. Uh, we are going through a, a tough patch in our own national life, and it's only natural for Japan to wonder, since it's been so dependent upon the U.S., whether or not that dependence is warranted and how it can be diversified. Thirdly, uh, when I went out to the Philippines in 1982, I remember my wife was visiting cabinet members and she would come home with these horrible tales about uh, from cabinet mm -hmm. members' wives about how Japanese soldiers had treated uh, young Japanese or young Filipino babies and all that kind of stuff. But today the Philippine government is calling on Japan as there are a number of other Southeast Asian countries calling publicly for Japan to take on a larger, more ambitious security role in the region. So I think the combination of uh, Chinese power, uncertainties about the U.S., uh, changing attitudes among other Asians has encouraged Japan uh, to look to take on a more ambitious uh, security role. And they have done so. Uh, they've done so by amending a number of the self-imposed limits on Japan's defense policy, the most recent one that they've amended has been the export of military equipment, which opens up a new dimension uh, for security relations between Japan and India. They have done so by creating a National Security Council to assure the coordination of the various instruments of foreign policy. They've done so by reinterpreting the collective right of self-defense. They've always claimed that right, but they've always uh, self-consciously insisted that they wouldn't exercise it. Now they specified to uh, rather precisely the uh, detailed conditions under which they might exercise it. They are moving their forces, which were deployed for years up in the northern uh, island, Hokkaido, south, because Russians don't present the threat now. They're moving it toward uh, the threat that they feel could come from China and to defend the southwest islands, which they feel are now in peril. They, uh, have been expanding their security connections with a variety of other countries. <coughs> India, Australia included among great naval power. But the Southeast Asian countries, there's naval cooperation being expanded with the Filipinos, the Vietnamese, and a host of others, including not only the sale of equipment, but a lot of uh, joint training. So in a variety of ways, uh, the Japanese are taking on a, a, an enlarged security their responsibility, and when they look at India, they see a country that shares with Japan a concern about the safety of sea lanes uh, through the Indian Ocean, South China Sea, to the East China Sea, and they see a country that uh, wants to keep China at bay, although I think the Japanese increasingly recognize that that's a greater source, that is the, the verbalizing of that anti-Chinese sentiment is a matter of greater sensitivity here in India than perhaps now. Uh, it is in Japan. But in any event, the, the security role is changing and 
it, it is reflected in a growing sense that India is a strategic partner. The third, uh, Mr. Abe, as you know, has been a revisionist of sorts in the history realm. Uh, I personally regret that he's focused so much attention on that because it's complicated his relations with his nearest neighbors in China and Korea. And it has also complicated, I believe, the acceptance elsewhere in Asia of this growing security role. The Chinese have taught, sought to brand that as a reversion or a revival of Japanese militarism. It's nothing of the sort. It's difficult to imagine a country whose population is both aging and declining and which faces these extraordinary public finance dilemmas uh, turning to militarism. Uh, but the Chinese are attempting to put that brand on it and it's a little harder to uh, dispose of that brand when the, when the revisionist uh, history issues keep coming up in an unfortunate way. But I mention this because uh, in Japan's relation with India, there's no historical baggage. Uh, the relationship has been continuous in a formal way since 1952, but the collaboration was there when Indian forces uh, fought alongside uh, imperial forces from Japan against the British back in the 1940s. So I think it's, a, it's one of those relationships which Japan feels comfortable with because it doesn't confront uh, the historical issues. Now finally, I would say that uh, from a political standpoint, the relationship is also uh, free of trouble. Uh, both countries are democracies. Both countries uh, are, have large Buddhist populations, and Buddhism was mediated, of course, into Japan through Korea and China, but it gives them a, a common cultural background of, I think, real consequence. Uh, when you take public opinion polls in Japan, India always rises to among the highest uh, countries in which there's a favorable rating by the, by the uh, average Japanese, and I think the same is true in India and Japan. It is a, it's a country which share, the two countries share this desire for greater international recognition through a permanent seat on the Security Council. These are countries that have developed a very elaborate structure of consultations from regular visits uh, between the Prime Ministers, and there's a tremendous personal rapport think, between Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi. But on virtually every subject, there are huge numbers of dialogues, as we were being uh, informed this morning by Kathy, uh, because many of our interlocutors, uh, or the American interlocutors, show up and seek a free room at Kathy's residence. <laughs> so wherever you look, it seems to me uh, Japan sees in this relationship something that's quite unique, a huge economic future a strategic partnership on security questions, a relationship that's free of the kind of tensions that uh, strain their ties with Korea and China, and a country which shares a host of uh, common political perspectives and common political interests. So I would say, if you were looking at this like a weather forecaster, the Japanese would view this as a situation in which there are sunny skies, there are very few clouds on the horizon, and the forecast is for perhaps occasional squalls, but uh, generally continuation of the current good weather for a long time to come. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. But just, uh, again, may I just uh, ask one quick question? Is and did, did you make much of the handshake between uh, Abe and Jinping, uh, the president of China? I mean, someone reported that it was actually... Well, the, the, the atmospherics that, uh, were not particularly good, yeah. but at least it provides a, a, a starting point mm -hmm. for a, a rewarming of that relationship. But, uh, you know, for a long time, the territorial issue was on the, on the shelf. Uh, I think in the early days, after 1972 and 1978, there was a kind of, you know, perhaps a shared understanding. It was in the interest of both countries to handle that with great delicacy. The Chinese had said they would leave it to future generations to resolve. The Japanese handled it with great delicacy. Whenever land, uh, Chinese or Japanese landed, they got them off the island quickly. They didn't build any permanent structures. They didn't send military forces down to that area. They didn't allow <coughs> unilateral uh, exploitation of the material resources in the surrounding sea. So they handled it, I think, with great delicacy. Then two incidents occurred in 2010-2012. One involved a, an inebriated Chinese fishing uh, captain who rammed a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. 
and the Japanese thought uh, for a time about taking him home and prosecuting him under Japanese domestic law. That incensed the Chinese, and they reacted in an over-the-top way. And in 2012, of course, there was the Japanese effort to avoid having Governor Ishihara of Tokyo uh, buy three of the islands, so they bought them themselves. That, of course, uh, set off an effort by the Chinese to create what amounts to a parallel or competing administrative uh, control regime. And uh, that has become increasingly dangerous. I think both countries recognize the danger. Both, I think, don't want to go to war over these five small islands. And the handshake represented a decision by both sides to formulate a, a diplomatic formula which allows both to save face at home, to try to claim a certain triumph at home, but to get the issue off the front burner and to create some kind of mechanism of communication between the militaries so that uh, they can better manage it. So I, I regard it as a good thing. It's not changed it absolutely. It require careful management on both sides, but it was a significant change. Oh, good. Um, <coughs> Professor uh, Wu Sheng is the director of the Asia, Asia Pacific, sure I understand Asia Pacific Research Center, and uh, um, he has a very distinguished academic background. Uh, before coming to Stanford, he was at the University of Iho I I Iowa and the University of California. He is now the uh, the head of this uh, this, uh, this center, and he's also a professor of sociology. Uh, professor, you're going to speak on Korea, yes. South Korea. So, okay, thank you. Um, uh, as you know, uh, in the media. You know, bad news uh, sells better, right? And also, you get more attention when there's a tension uh, between countries. But uh, when you think of uh, relations between uh, India and, and South Korea, uh, I cannot think of any really bad news or uh, major tension. So let me start with a story that I uh, learned or heard uh, when I was very young uh, in Korea. And maybe Professor Lagavan can confirm this is uh, true or not. Uh, but according to uh, this uh, legend, about 2,000 years ago, a princess from the Ayutthaya Empire of India uh, came to Korea, uh, marrying uh, King Suro. And they had uh, 10 sons and two daughters. And they began uh, the Kim and Kim clan. And the clan accounts for about 10% of the Korean population. So if this is true, <laughs> then one out of every 10 Koreans have Indian blood. <laughs> is it true? Well, they, they've said, I mean, there is a legend, and uh, I feel even if there isn't, true historical evidence, why not promote it? Because it, it's a, it's a win-win situation for both countries. So and that means that uh, Indian Korean relations goes back to 2,000 years. Yes. <laughs> but now uh, let's look at uh, today. Uh, I think uh, economic relations between two countries, uh, I mean, you know, India and South Korea, uh, is becoming uh, more and more important. Uh, as you know, uh, two countries uh, signed a free trade agreement uh, about five years ago. And in 1973, uh, the trade volume between India and South Korea was only like uh, 15 million dollars. But uh, let's say, you know, now, you know, you know many billion dollars. So it grew really uh, substantial, so substantially, and unlike uh, you know free trade agreement with the U.S. or EU, uh, you know this trade agreement with India uh, recognizes uh, products from Kaesong. You know Kaesong is uh, industrial complex in North Korea, as also uh, South Korean products. And I believe that there are more than 600 uh, Korean companies uh, operating uh, in India. Uh, actually, some people uh, began to use uh, this term. I don't know how popular this is, but you know, 
Coach India, so Korea, China, uh, India. Uh, I mean, we know some people use the term you know, India, right? Yeah. China, mm -hmm. uh, India, but now they are adding Korea into these two countries, uh, saying that uh, you know, with all due respect to Japan, <laughs> so the three countries has new engine uh, for Asian uh, growth. Uh, actually, right now, uh, you know, China, India, Korea, uh, they are the top three countries mm -hmm. to send their students to the United States. And that's true uh, at Stanford University uh, as well. And in Silicon Valley, uh, where we live, uh, Indians, Chinese, and Koreans make up the top three largest uh, ethnic groups in tech companies. I think about 50% of tech companies in Silicon Valley uh, come from uh, those three countries. So I think uh, my point is that economically, uh, India <coughs> and South Korea are really improving uh, their ties and, and relations. Now we have a uh, Korean ambassador in the audience, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> in my presentation. So in India, uh, Korean community has grown uh, substantially you know, with uh, Korean companies like POSCO, uh, Hyundai Motors, uh, Samsung, right? And <coughs> as I understand, there are over 10,000 uh, Koreans uh, live in India. And you know, I think there are three universities uh, in India have a uh, Korean studies program. And also uh, in South Korea, uh, Indian you know, presence uh, is growing. Uh, I think right now over you know, 10,000 uh, Indian uh, workers, especially uh, engineers, are, are living uh, in, in South Korea. Uh, in case of you know, Samsung, uh, they hired more foreign uh, software engineers than uh, Korean nationals, and a great portion of them uh, come from India. So let me sh uh, share with you uh, my own study, uh, what I call you know, global talent. And you know, you know, our main argument is that uh, many advanced countries uh, like uh, Korea, uh, they are competing uh, for you know, you know, you know, you know, talent you know, globally. Uh, especially in case of South Korea, they are facing you know, big problem uh, in recruiting uh, software engineers. Uh, you know, as you know, you know, Samsung has become a global company. Uh, Samsung is very good uh, in manufacturing, in hardware uh, engineering, but very weak uh, in software uh, engineers. So that uh, the India has been you know, supplying you know, a big portion of uh, software engineers uh, for you know, companies like Samsung. So in our study, uh, we uh, interviewed actually uh, many uh, Indian uh, software engineers uh, working in <coughs> Korea and also who used to be uh, working in Korea. Uh, I think uh, taking uh, foreign uh, professionals uh, is a big challenge uh, for Korea because uh, Korea has been ethnically homogeneous uh, for a long time. And you know, to be honest, uh, Korea is not a country you know, that is uh, good for foreigners. I think you know, it's not an easy country just like Japan uh, uh, to live uh, for foreigners. So, so when I interview uh, Indian engineers, uh, they are saying that uh, in terms of their work, uh, you know, they are fine. I mean, the, the language is fine, you know, work culture is fine. You know, Samsung and they, they are really global companies and so on. But what they really complained about was the lack of understanding about Indian culture, uh, Indian religion, even Indian food. Uh, I grew up uh, in Korea really you know, loving curry. I mean, we say, you know, curry rice, right? It's kind of <laughs> curry with rice. <laughs> so we certainly loved uh, Indian food, but still, even today, uh, you know, many Indian uh, engineers, uh, they are concerned that there are not the, you know, you know, many good uh, Indian restaurants. Uh, you know, many Korean uh, 
I think there are very few places uh, to teach uh, about India in Korean universities. Uh, in India, there are three centers of Korean studies. So I guess uh, my suggestion and what I even propose is that yeah, two countries uh, really have to work hard to improve uh, mutual understanding of their history, tradition, uh, culture, uh, and so on. So I'm very happy to see three centers of Korean studies uh, at uh, India, and we will be visiting two of them uh, tomorrow, JNU and uh, University of Delhi. But uh, I sincerely hope that the you know, Korean government can uh, more and better support uh, Korean studies in India, and then same thing uh, for Indian studies uh, in Korea. So, so let me let me end uh, that way. Then I open up for any <coughs> questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, uh, Professor Sidhu, who's from Brookings, uh, senior fellow of Brookings India, and. Uh, a senior fellow of Brookings Institution to give his comments, and if I understand correctly, you're going to wrap it all up, is it? And with a focus on, with a focus on, on India, and then and then we'll have, uh, 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 I hope, uh, at least half now for for questions and answers. And as the professor said, he really would like to hear from you. Right. You'd like to learn that, sure. that, yeah, uh, yes. as much as as much as respond. So. Well, Vikram, thanks. Uh, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for anybody to try and sum up, you know, such a rich discussion. Uh, but what I'd probably like to do is present a little bit of a point of view from New Delhi, and then also throw up a set of questions which may be worth kind of, you know, exploring and uh, looking, looking into in some more detail in the Q&A. Now, you know, no uh, self-respecting panel on foreign policy uh, can do without its uh, share of acronyms. And I think I need to begin uh, with two to try and explain what is the range and scope of India's uh, security concerns today. And there's two sets of acronyms, TTP and TPP. Uh, both of them, I think, uh, would be familiar to panelists, but certainly to Jen Lichtenberry, uh, the Tariq e Taliban Pakistan and the whole sort of transnational terrorism that Jen Lichtenberry talked about to the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and how that sort of relates in some ways is really the spectrum of interests and concerns of India as we stand today, but certainly of, of this government. Um, if I, again, just to elaborate on that and expand on that a little further, if I was to be asked, what is the one fundamental objective of the Modi government? Uh, it would be simply for India to become the third largest economy by 2025. And by the way, that may seem way into the future, but in fact, it will probably be at the end of a second Modi term, if there is a second Modi term. So it's actually not so far into the future. Uh, and incidentally, even that desire to emerge as the third largest economy in the world does have historical linkages. Because very much like China, India and Indian experts will point out to the 1500s, where, again, you know, between China and India, they had 50% of the global GDP, uh, roughly about 25% each, uh, give or take a little bit. And so that remains one of the key uh, drivers even today. Now, to achieve this fundamental goal, uh, India needs, uh, needs to strive towards uh, creating two conditions. One is a no-war conflict, uh, kind of a no-war scenario, uh, certainly in its immediate neighborhood, but also, I think, broadly, globally. And hence, I think, you know, uh, India's sort of hesitation and the spurt towards, uh, you know, uh, or move towards conflict or, or other kinds of challenges, particularly in the Middle East. And here, Northeast Asia really poses a key challenge because you know, for the, for the longest time after the end of the Cold War, everybody was focused on intrastate conflict. And in fact, many of the conflicts that we see, uh, you know, the major powers involved in were intrastate conflicts. But perhaps for the first time since the end of the Cold War, the possibility of an interstate conflict is actually very real in Northeast Asia, uh, more than in any other part of the world. Uh, some might say South Asia, and that remains the case too. But I think Northeast Asia is, is another critical area that we need to uh, focus on as well. Um, 
The second uh, sort of set of conditions that India needs to create uh, is build global institutions that are going to advance its economic objective. And this is really in areas where there are no institutions, norms at the moment. And these relate right from climate change. Uh, you know, Professor Shin, you talked about this being like California weather. I think in some ways that is the impact of climate change that you're starting to see here as well. No, I, well, I, 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 I think, you know, Indian winter is probably even better than California weather, I, well, I dare to say. Um, so on climate, on cyber, uh, on energy, on trade, uh, on oceans, we talked about, on outer space. All of these are issues that we need, uh, you know, to build institutions and norms because they don't exist really at the moment. And here again, India is seeking for uh, keen partners to work at in that, in that sort of direction. So this brings me uh, to the fundamental question of how New Delhi might look at two or three key actors in this desire and objective. One is the United States, obviously. Uh, because, you know, given the new, uh, the, the new sort of oomph in the partnership going forward, but the second is the role of U.S. allies. And I want to touch on both of those briefly, Vikram, before I, before I end. Um, the fundamental question I think that New Delhi want, is asking uh, of the United States in particular is not necessarily whether uh, the U.S. position is becoming weak or irrelevant. I don't think that's a question. Uh, that, that is being asked in New Delhi at all. I think that's a given, that's taken uh, as granted. The question is, as this world is moving into a post-Cold War world, uh, post-Cold War world and, and evolving into a new world order, what is the fundamental US objective? Is it to preserve the status quo as it exists? Or is it to work with countries like India and other potential allies to evolve a new world order? Uh, because if it is the former, then frankly, it's a Herculean task for any country, including the United States. Because while the US will remain the primary power, it is no longer in a position to determine uh, or preserve the world as it exists today on its own. And that becomes an important kind of role uh, to see how India might, might evolve in, in, in that direction as well. However, if the US is cognizant of this transition and is keen on leading that transition, then it remains to be seen how the US would want to engage India and other allies in that trans, uh, transitional process. And here, uh, frankly, it's not quite clear what the process of thinking is in the US. And I think, you know, to be fair, it's evolving. So on the one hand, there's, there, there was uh, many talks, uh, talks that you might also be familiar with of the G2, uh, of a really kind of going back, if you like, to an era of superpower uh, <laughs> relations with the US and China instead of US and the Soviet Union. Uh, and that makes people in India extremely nervous. Uh, because the sense then is that, look, if that's what's going to be the case, then why would India necessarily want to be supportive or engage? And what would be the objective uh, in that process of, of engagement as well? And just to highlight or, or give a vignette of that concern, is the bilateral uh, US-China uh, deal on climate change. Now, I think this is really good for climate change, uh, but I think there should also be a dimension of engaging with other countries which are going to be important in trying to evolve an institution for global climate change, i.e. India. And where is that conversation going to happen? And how is that conversation uh, going to happen? Where will the US want to lead it? Now, uh, in this context, uh, just, just in, uh, another element that, that was talked about as well, uh, the South China Seas. It's a very peculiar situation that a country which has actually signed up to the laws of the seas is the one which is challenging the basic principles of that, whereas a country which, which is now upholding the laws of the seas, rightly so, has actually not ratified the treaty. And I think you can see there's a little bit of a tension you know, uh, going forward there as well. Uh, just uh, touching uh, parenthetically on climate change, 
uh, there's also the element of, uh, of, of nuclear energy. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to this a little bit in the role of uh, the U.S. allies uh, going, going forward. Um, so le le let me talk about the two uh, key allies that have been talked about here, uh, Japan and then uh, Korea, uh, Republic of Korea. And uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Amakos was absolutely right in saying that, uh, you know, Indians fought with Japan, uh, with Japanese, in the Second World War. But India fought with the Allies against Japan. And it's actually quite interesting that the Japanese onslaught right up the Burmese Peninsula was finally stopped at Kohima. Uh, you know, and, and that, I think, is something that we need to, uh, with, by the way, a little help uh, from the uh, United States and uh, uh, the United Kingdom. In fact, it's ironic that uh, the base where B-24 Liberator bombers flew into China is today becoming, is now the base of the first, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, mountain assault uh, division being created against China. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of dy uh, dynamic going, going forward there as well. So I think vis-a-vis -vis Japan, uh, uh, Ambassador, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, it is a good news relationship with a few dark clouds. And one of them is actually on uh, the nuclear dimension. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the Japanese have two reservations uh, on the nuclear front. One is on new India's status as a nuclear weapon state. Uh, that's something that is going to be very difficult uh, a, a reality for uh, Tokyo to accept. But I think it's going to be an important reality for Tokyo to accept to move the relationship forward. The second is uh, on the nuclear uh, deal. Uh, you know, today India is having a, a very, uh, very serious uh, nuclear negotiations with ROK. In fact, there were negotiations just two days ago uh, in New Delhi. Uh, it is also now thinking of having uh, a similar dialogue with China. Uh, but the one country with which it needs to have that dialogue and which is not going forward is Japan. Uh, and that has, has implications not only for India and Japan, but also for nuclear power plants to be built by the United States and France in India. So I think it's got a, you know, if you like, a multiplier effect which needs to be uh, addressed as well. Uh, last but not the least, let me turn ve uh, very quickly to uh, India ROK relations. And I completely agree with uh, Professor Shin that this is very much a good news story. In fact, some Indian um, uh, scholars and experts have said that the BRICS acronym, as it stands today, will only be complete if you have Korea added to that as well, and it would actually be more accurate too. Um, the one dark cloud, if you like, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the bilateral relationship is ROK's membership, what is known as the uh, Uniting for Consensus Club. And this is a group of countries which are not necessarily as enthusiastic of the reform of the UN Security Council. Now, of course, um, ROK's uh, relationship in that, or role in that, is really driven from its relationship vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Uh, but I think it is something that India you know, also needs to look at and see how that's going to play out, given India's ambition to play a greater role in the UN Security Council. Um, so I think part of the uh, limits on India's greater engagement with Northeast Asia is also the relationship between the various US allies in the region. Uh, and here I'm particularly talking about the relationship between Japan and ROK, uh, which is as problematic uh, for Washington as it is for New Delhi. Uh, so let me then kind of end on what may be one possible way forward in looking at Northeast Asia uh, in a slightly more cooperative approach among these major powers. And this is not an original idea. Uh, Ambassador Sham Saran, uh, you know, the chairman of the National Security Advisory Board, among others, have suggested this. And that is the idea of something like an organization for security and cooperation in Asia, or if you like, OSCA. Uh, but it's obviously not going to be like the OSCE, very different. 
Uh, but I think this may be something worth exploring, and certainly one that I hope your center, uh, Professor, will take up. Uh, and certainly Brookings India would be very happy to work on that uh, going forward as well. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, uh, a very uh, interesting overview, uh, uh, WPS. Um, look, I'm certainly not going to try and summarize this rich discussion, although I, I, I have some clear takeaways which w which could be perhaps succinctly uh, stated. Um, I mean, economics, yeah, that's the driver of the relationship uh, between India and all of the three countries really we've, we've talked about. Um, but there are limitations to how far we can build on economics or rely on economics to build a strategic and durable relationship going that extends towards the long term. There are political limitations, there are cultural limitations, there are strategic limitations. How we're going to resolve the limitations, I think, is, 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 is a big question. And every country has, India vis-a-vis -vis each of these countries has a very specific challenge. So India and China, we all have talked about that uh, at, in ad nauseum, the border issue, of course, still remains. Um, India and Japan, you, you've just touched on the nuclear dimension, that's, that's, that's an issue. Um, India and Korea is not a strategic issue, but clearly our relationship cannot go forward if we don't have a better understanding of who we are, what we are, what's the cultural sort of nuance underpinning this relationship. Um, the fact that there are no institutions, something you touched on, or there are very few institutions that bring us together, I think is a good point and needs to be, needs to be tackled. Um, um, and then the role of the U.S., how is the U.S. going to actually play a role in uh, in this area, in this region, and will it be a constructive role? Will it be dominated by its own rivalry or its own relationship with the U.S. or with it, with China in particular? Um, and uh, will India be seen as a bridge uh, uh, between, uh, or as a counterweight? What? There are so many questions. So um, this is a rich kind of a subject, but. At the end of the day, I think what's driving everyone at this point in time, and the leadership in particular, I, I sense, is really the economics. There's huge economic potential and huge economic sort of opportunities. And if those can be realized, then I, I, for one, believe that some of the other issues begin to sort themselves out. It's not going to be easy, but they begin to... Then the risks of an unintended conflict, our conflict, become reduced considerably. Um, look, um, I have so many questions, but I really don't want to hog this. We have half an hour, and if, if of course, the, the group sitting in front of me does not have any questions, and that's not going to be the case, there are five, <laughs> seven hands have been raised, I will. So, um, may I ask, uh, yes, but first, uh, you, please, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yes. And, uh, Can I have a microphone? Yeah. Is there, are there any microphones? Yeah. Oh, no Maybe if you can uh, just raise your voice. Uh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Jun Gyu Lee. I'm a South Korean ambassador uh, based in Delhi. I've been here uh, slightly more than two years. Uh, first of all, uh, I must uh, express my, my opinion uh, about the future of India. Uh, I, I have been very happy to witness the big change happening in India. You know, uh, in last May, uh, Indian people chose Modi government. And the Modi government is moving toward the brighter future of India. Uh, maybe in a couple of years, I expect that we might be talking about a rise of India instead of uh, a rise of China. And let me uh, slightly touch upon uh, the bilateral relationship between uh, Korea and India. Uh, we have uh, kept a very good relationship uh, since uh, we may talk about uh, our relationship for thousands of years. This, we are expanding this relationship uh, from, uh, from economic fields uh, to, uh, to other fields, including uh, you know, strategic, political, and even uh, military fields. That is based upon uh, the uh, strategic partnership which was concluded in 
in 2010. I totally agree uh, with, uh, with Professor uh, Shin uh, on the point that uh, we should expand this relation to, to more social and more cultural fields. We are very much aware of that. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, that's why our two governments set up uh, cultural centers in both capitals of our countries. Uh, uh, both cultural centers are doing uh, their role very, uh, very much in promoting uh, our uh, our culture uh, to uh, to to the to, uh, to the peoples. And uh, the Korean language promotion, uh, by Korean governments uh, doing doing hard to do that. Uh, as an ambassador to India, I'm trying very hard uh, to increase the money <laughs> in supporting uh, that Korean. Uh, Korean language centers in, in universities. So as time goes, I expect that uh, the, the bilateral relationship between our two countries uh, will improve a lot. And uh, we may see uh, you know, the, uh, uh, one more very good couple in the world. Uh, I, I express it, uh, the best friends in the world. As Pres uh, Professor Shin, expressed that uh, our two countries <coughs> has no conflict, namely, uh, we don't have any border, uh, sharing border, we don't have any history uh, conflict. So there is, uh, there is only things for us in which we, sh we can and we should cooperate. So as an ambassador, I have an ambition to make our two countries, to make our two peoples the best friends in the world. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. That uh, really rounds it off. Thank you. Um, yes, sir, you're next. Then, then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm talking to Ambassador uh, Eikenberry and his India US. Just, just tell us who you are, please. You oh, just introduce yourself. I'm you Professor mind. Lamba from Delhi University. Thank you. Uh, I'm talking to Ambassador Akinbari and his talk about India-US-China relationships. Sir, I recall when uh, Einstein was teaching at Institute of Advanced uh, Technology, Princeton, New Jersey, he set one year examination paper and gave it to his teaching assistant. And his teaching assistant said, well, this is the same paper you gave last year. He said, yes, it is. <laughs> But answers have changed this year. <laughs> Indian government has changed, but I think answers have not changed. 50%, my information is, 50% of the deficit of American government uh, of $13 trillion and a lot of change belongs to China. So in this scenario, how do you look at the trade relationship between US and India and China vis-a-vis -vis China, you know? Our FDI concept is Walmart. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just hold off, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll just take a few questions and then, so if you don't. Yes, sir. Dipanka <coughs> uh, Banerjee from the Forum for Strategic Initiatives in Delhi, Think Tank. Uh, brilliant presentations. Two issues. Firstly, on the security question. As one looks at the scenario in Asia, in spite of all the issues and problems in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, perhaps the immediate problem in Asia is going to be faced from further to the west in the rise of not the TPP so much as uh, the ISIS. I think some very fundamental challenges are being thrown up as a consequence of this recent development, which will, ha which will affect fundamentally, firstly, of course, Afghanistan and its transition, and secondly, of course, the developments of all of South Asia. Do you see any possibility of cooperation amongst the Asian countries, and here, of course, very importantly, that of China, to accept this as a principal challenge, and therefore, to build cooperation amongst countries to deal with it. Of course, we're aware of the recent developments in Xinjiang, specifically from March of this year, 
and all that has happened in the intervening months and the concerns that have grown in China regarding dealing with this problem. Yet, its economic interests and activities are attempting to link China rapidly with South and uh, South, South Asia, the Southwest part of Asia, and to Europe. <coughs> How will that be affected? The second issue is really, uh, Dr. Sito mentioned regarding the issue of the New World Order. But the principal challenge that arises, I think, as Kissinger highlighted in his recent book, that uh, the perception of world order in Beijing is fundamentally different from how the rest of the world looks at the possibility of arranging an international relationship. And here, the question of that uh, the son of heaven, that direct concept of power through China to the world, etc., is probably going to shape the relationships of China with its neighbors <coughs> and that with the rest of the world. Do you, think, do you see any possibility of that China's concept of the Middle Kingdom perception of world order changing and adjusting to the realities of tomorrow in, the, in Asia and the world? Thank you. Yes, sir, I'm Dasper. I'm uh, Mr. Tayal, former ambassador to Korea. In uh, Northeast Asia, we have uh, both Japan and Korea as our strategic partners. But of course, uh, Japan and Korea don't say eye to eye on many matters. We also have an incipient trilateral dialogue between <coughs> India, Japan, and Republic of Korea, and Mr. HK Singh is heavily involved with that. But the impression one gets is that uh, it is not getting much traction. It is a track to dialogue. So my question to the panel is, uh, what could be the suggestions that uh, the subjects if that trilateral dialogue could deal with? And one idea which comes to my mind is that India, for India, Myanmar is very, very important, very critical to our Middle East policy. And Myanmar, so strengthening of democratic institutions in Myanmar, India, Japan, and Korea could work together, and that will effectively keep China out. And uh, also, the three countries working together for this construction of road from India to Thailand, because that is very critical for our Middle policy, and not much is happening in Myanmar. The date of the construction of the segment in Myanmar keeps on getting shifted from 15 to 16 to 17 to 18. Thank you. Okay, so let's. Uh, there are four questions on on the table, and uh, essentially the first is. What is the consequence of the trade or economic imbalance between China and, and the U.S.? The second is uh, what I think this question actually you did answer already, but uh, Professor might want, might want you to repeat. What is is ISIS a threat to uh, the <coughs> South Asia, Northeast Asian region? Is there an opportunity there? Third is uh, same. Uh, what is the China worldview? <laughs> well, yeah, um, is it interested in global governance? Is it interested in being part of the global community? And the fourth is, uh, what are the options and opportunities for uh, the trilateral dialogue? You know, and can that be uh, also extended to include Myanmar and uh, become a material uh, factor in building relationships? So I'm going to just uh, ask each each of you. Maybe you don't have to necessarily answer, but uh, I'll. I'll I'll start with you, uh, General, and answer whichever of those questions you wish to answer. Well, on, on uh, trade with uh, China, it's, it's uh, true that the United States has, has our own huge trade imbalance with China. I think bilateral trade is at $500 billion a year, and I think uh, out of that we've got about a $150 billion trade uh, deficit, so it's sizable. Um, China is a large holder of U.S. Uh, Treasury bills. It, it holds a, uh, a significant portion of our debt. On the other hand, uh, some of the fundamentals in the relationship may be changing. Uh, the uh, cost of wages in China are increasing. It's not as attractive a de uh, destination now for foreign investment that it was. China's population is uh, starting to age. Uh, they've got uh, now fewer people going into the uh, workforce than are retiring. 
And if you look at the demographics of India, and if you look at opportunities in India from the United States perspective, uh, they're quite attractive. So I think the possibilities for over the next several decades to see a shift in uh, favored destinations away from China, with another factor being that uh, China is a result, I think, of its very assertive foreign policy that it's had within the region over the last decade, has more within the region that are looking to diversify, and nations are worried about their own dependency. So there's possibilities there. And I don't know, Kathy, if you wanted to uh, add anything there on U.S.-India uh, no. economics. Um, on uh, the rise of uh, ISIS, what, what we're facing is that there's three, there's three factors that are at work here. One is, the, uh, in certain parts of the world, there's a breakdown of very fragile states. So breakdowns of state we're seeing now in the extreme in Syria, which is uh, almost disintegrated. Uh, we see the potential for that in Afghanistan, if the recovery of Afghanistan should stall out and have reversion. We see, so internal within these areas, you have a second factor, uh, which is often related, and you have states on the outside that are fighting proxy wars in these areas. So in the case of Syria, uh, you can talk about uh, trying to fix what's inside of Syria, but you probably more appropriately would start in Ankara and uh, Riyadh and in Tehran to talk to them about the proxy wars that they're fighting in those areas. Um, in the case of Afghanistan, it's important you uh, start in Islamabad because of a semi-proxy war that they've been uh, fighting there for many years now. And then third, you have this uh, very severe threat of just the, uh, this uh, romanticism about uh, the idea of going and fighting for theocratic uh, Islam that uh, is starting to be seen in, in uh, Western societies, and certainly being seen in Pakistan to a very worrisome extent. It's even seen in Tunisia. The largest number of recruits from abroad that are fighting in Syria right now are coming from Tunisia, which is uh, trumpeted as a success so far in the uh, very disappointing Arab Spring that occurred. So these are all important factors, and then how to, these, uh, how to deal with these, uh, the possibility for collaboration and cooperation among various powers, the United States, China, and India, I think they're there. In the case of Afghanistan, what is needed is Afghanistan needs two things to succeed. It needs a continued level of international support, it's going to remain an aid-dependent country for many, many years, but it's, but it's had tremendous success over the last 12 to 13 years. The Afghanistan of today is on a different planet than the Afghanistan of 2001, but they are going to continue to need foreign aid, and they're going to need to uh, continued security assistance support. So I was very happy to see that uh, President Ashraf Ghani, on his uh, first trip abroad, went to a Beijing, and he got a commitment from Beijing of $300 million more dollars made. And Beijing also said that it would get involved in trying to deliver a political, or help with a political settlement, which is the second requirement in Afghanistan. They have to have broad political reconciliation that goes beyond uh, reconciliation just with the Taliban. But the fact remains that you've got spoiler countries around. So even if China, India, the United States, Russia, everybody collaborates and works hard to provide support to Afghanistan, that these spoiler states, Pakistan, Iran, they, because of the fragility of the situation there, they can upset things enough that no matter how much external support is given, they're going to set things back. So I think Afghanistan is good as an example to look at how the world should be seeing these different problems of the current manifestation of theocratic, violent Islam being ISIS, but it will probably mutate into something else. And finally on China, uh, the question of uh, how does China see the world and what do they see their role in the world as being. When you uh, look at the international norms and uh, rules that are out there, of which China, by being uh, playing uh, within these institutions, has benefited greatly by. I think the question for the world, the question for the United States, is that 
given that there's a redistribution of global power going on right now, of which India is a very big part of. Power is shifting to India. Are the rules, the general rules and principles, are they going to be followed? But, of course, then based upon the redistribution of global power, should more voting rights, so to speak, and amendments be given to these growing powers, but still follow the same general rules of open trading orders and liberal political systems. Or, in the case of China, when they talk about, well, the, the institutions, they're, un, they're not satisfied with them, do they want a revolutionary change of those institutions, in which case I think this would cause, could cause great tension in uh, years ahead. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, I think on the on the China-U.S. imbalance, uh, we're their biggest market, and uh, they're basically financing our deficits and offsetting a relatively meager savings rate in the U.S. So the Chinese are performing a great service for us. I don't think out of any goodwill for the U.S. Particularly, it's just the way that they're uh, recycling the balance in a way that actually helps us. But it uh, highlights the, the ultimately basic fundamental of the U.S.-China relationship. Because we are so economically interdependent, we've got a, a key a stake in e economic and political engagement with the Chinese, constructive engagement. At the same time, as Henry Kissinger has said, uh, Asia looks a lot like 19th century Europe. It doesn't look like 21st century Europe. And therefore, the kind of balance among states is critically important, so we hedge. So the U.S. relationship with China is always in search of a delicate balance between engagement on the one hand and hedging on the other. I think the Obama administration started out with a heavy lean toward engagement. And when Mr. Obama came back from his first trip to China, he felt kind of like he'd been pleased. And uh, we then shifted more toward hedging for the last couple of years. I think many were surprised at the positive outcome of the APEC meeting. And it uh, demonstrates again that when we put our minds to it, there is uh, something in it for both sides when we can collaborate. I, d I think the agreement on climate change was helpful because many other, other countries can take a walk on the climate change issue if the U.S. and China, which are the biggest polluters, can't do anything. When we demonstrate we can do something that requires some real change in both countries, then others are robbed of an excuse for doing nothing when we get together on a, on a broader multilateral basis. And we'll keep searching for the proper balance. The focus on these territorial disputes kind of put us in the direction of hedging because we've got allies who have territorial claims. We, we retain neutrality with respect to these claims, but the Japanese are close allies, and the Filipinos, we think, are in jeopardy of being bullied by the Chinese, and so we bolster our allies in that way. And one comment on ISIS, uh, it is ironic that we get out of Iraq, and what's the result? Uh, we're confronted with a more virulent strain of Islamic extremism. I think our experience in the Middle East over the last decade or more suggests to me that we don't want to be the key coalition partner. I think it has to be, we can provide air power, we can provide help to the Iraqi and some others. We can provide a lot of behind the scenes support. But I think a coalition against ISIS needs to be led by Muslims. And ISIS represents a much greater danger to Muslim countries in the neighborhood than it does to the United States. So I think a key question for the U.S. is how in the world we manage to play a helpful, responsible role without taking over this enterprise as an American enterprise, which will contribute to refueling uh, recruitment for uh, Muslim extremists, I fear. So I, uh, that's my take on it. And as far as Northeast Asia is concerned, my experience is more in, in Japan and Korea, and I don't think it inspires a huge fear in either country because they're racially homogeneous. They don't have Muslim to speak of. So it doesn't represent the kind of tangible, palpable threat to Japanese and Koreans that it does to some Chinese who have to worry about Xinjiang. It's been pretty, pretty violent up there recently. So I think you get a little different reaction from the Chinese than you do from other Northeast Asian countries. 
Would you like to say anything? Sure, yeah. So let me uh, mention about uh, some security challenges uh, that uh, South Korea is facing. Uh, in my view, uh, geopolitical landscape uh, in Northeast Asia in transition. And I think that's uh, you know, posing big challenges uh, for South Korea. You know, for example, you know, U.S. Uh, still remains uh, the main uh, military uh, ally for South Korea, but China has become so important uh, economically. Uh, as you know, you know, China has become the largest uh, trading partner for South Korea. And you know, South Korea really has to be very careful not being in cut between uh, China and, and the United States. I think one example, uh, you know, lately, uh, U.S. Uh, has been asking uh, South Korea to deploy THAAD, and, but uh, China has protested, so pushing, you know, pressing uh, South Korea not to do that. But, so that's one example, but I think uh, it's a dilemma that South Korea may be uh, we're already facing a dilemma you know, between uh, two big powers. And as, as mentioned also, uh, South Korea and Japan are still fighting over you know, history issues. <coughs> and you know, President Park Geun-hye and Abe you know, ha has not yet done any uh, and, you know, in a formal summit. And some people are saying that uh, they, they will be summit between two leaders, <laughs> right? So uh, it's a very tough issue on both countries. And both Japan and South Korea are, are main allies for the United States. So I think that's a big challenge. And third one, uh, not really, really mentioned about North Korea, but still it's there. And led by a very young leader. And I don't think North Korea will collapse anytime soon. But still a lot of uncertainties uh, for the future of the country. So I think all combined, I think right now South Korea is facing you know, big challenges. And it won't be easy, you know, to figure out all those puzzles. Mm -hmm. uh, very briefly, two points. I didn't mention uh, ISIS because it doesn't rhyme with TPP. But, uh, but most seriously, it, it, it is relevant. It is important. And everything you want to read about ISIS and the threat to South Asia, it's out in the briefing book uh, that we've just put out, uh, out, out there. But I think this, uh, you know, I think you know, General Eikenberry has really put it very well in terms of the kind of uh, three levels of threat that we're trying to, see, you know, seeing from uh, um, radical Islam, if you like. But I just want to point out a couple of uh, dimensions there which are worth exploring. One of them is we are also seeing people in ISIS uh, and in those countries who are actually not Muslims, uh, and they're from Europe. Uh, in fact, some of the most brutal fighters uh, have been from Europe. And this, in a way, I think is a little bit of an alarm bell as to countries, uh, you know, which are having issues with their own multicultural, multi-ethnic identities. There's a r serious alienation going on, which is transcending some of these kind of challenges. And how do you address that? So I would agree with uh, uh, Ambassador Amakost. I think, you know, you need to have the countries in the region taking the lead, but I think Europeans and would also need to look at their own domestic situation to see why this is starting to happen. And second is, you know, what kind of force do you want to put together? Uh, does something like ISAF actually work? Would that be one model to explore? Uh, and what, you know, what kind of countries might be involved there, I think is something uh, worth exploring as well. And just very briefly on the China dimension of it, and again, very much, you know, whether China is going to follow the rules of the road or not. It has officially signed up to many of them, being a member of the UN, etc. But I think this is where having something like an OSCE in Asia, call it OSCA or whatever, is perhaps a useful way of trying to socialize China even further into ensuring that it sticks to those rules of the road. Okay, next round of questions. Uh, yes. By Jyoti Raghavan, Chairperson Center for Korean Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, 
just to uh, uh, correct you, Professor Shin, there are more than three universities that teach Korean in India. There are about six now, six now. and growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, good it's, yes, it's good. And to reiterate what Ambassador uh, Lee said, that the uh, Korea-India relations are on a really growing path. Um, we have no historical baggages, whatever, or no uh, border disputes, nothing. In fact, shared history. Uh, past history of Buddhism and everything. Uh, yes, the only hitch being <coughs> that the cultural understanding between the two countries is lacking. And uh, there he says, uh, now that the culture center has come, maybe they would help. But more than that, I think an orientation program for anybody who wishes to do business with India, uh, uh, Koreans, before they start business, and uh, uh, you know, why uh, uh, we the other uh, we Indians when we go there, um, if we are given an orientation program, it would go a long way. I think that there is a cultural gap in the way the orientation is completely different, and this does lead to a lot of misunderstandings. Right. Having said that, one question, sir, to you, and one to Ambassador Aikenberry. Um, you said uh, about the dilemma South Korea faces vis-a-vis uh, -vis its uh, China and US uh, uh, trade relations. Does it face a similar dilemma vis-a-vis -vis its China and India trade relations with its, uh, uh, in the region? If it wishes to increase its trade relations with India, it would need to cut down somewhere. Uh, so would it be willing to cut down its trade relations with China uh, to increase that with India? Uh, because India could be a stepping stone towards West Asia as well, uh, and to the Middle East. So is it considering that one question? And uh, Ambassador, I think you had talked about uh, uh, China being interested in um, restraining <coughs> nuclear proliferation, or rather unconventional, in the context of unconventional threats, um, that its interest lies in uh, containing. So. What is it doing uh, uh, regarding North Korean nuclear weapons uh, towards that end? Is it doing anything positive, or is it just sort of likes to maintain the status quo? OK, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm going to request everyone to be a little brief, because uh, we are uh, Oh. Running out of time. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was not that was not for you to. It was just generally because I got seven, eight hands suddenly raised. I'll try to be very brief. Yeah. I'm Admiral Anup Singh, retired. Um, questions. Um, my question is uh, generally towards the two former ambassadors, Ambassador Armacost in particular. There's been a gravitational shift which the world has been admiring to uh, in so far as capital flows and concentration of. Uh, export-oriented manufacturing hubs are concerned from the west to the east about two decades ago. Now we are all watching and getting alarmed at the geopolitical landscape that is changing by the day for the worse. Because the venture of this world in so far as trade, commerce, money, strategic material including oil and gas is the South China Sea. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, if you don't want to use the word contain, to get a dictation of the rules of the road to China. The assertiveness is going out of bounds. The Paracel Islands have witnessed five new projects in Xi Jinping's time. There were two before that. What does all this mean? It means there is an there is, the objective is to expand the power projection capabilities and extend its reach. The bringing in of that oil rig 981 in uh, May of this year was the most alarming thing. It is plonk inside the exclusive economic zone of Vietnam. The world just watched. So now with the latest round of elections, the DOP has got a majority, and what do we <coughs> see? Is UNCLOS now farther than the horizon insofar as ratification is concerned? <coughs> Till you do that, the Chinese are going to keep saying, you have no locus standi to intervene. $5.3 trillion of trade passes through the South China Sea. The alternative is going around Australia. Nobody can do that. 
So uh, India has very high stakes. 55% of our trade goes through that. We have many other economic interests in the region, and of course, we have strategic partnerships in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Sanjay from Ikria. Uh, this is question is to Professor Sid, what specific Indian interest will be served by creating a new architecture like OSCE instead of working on ASEAN-centered EAS? Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is uh, if you create an OSCE type of architecture, new architecture, Russia will also come into play. China and Russia sitting together, where will India be? Last question. Yes, I'm Ashraf Haidari, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Afghan Embassy. Uh, we have signed a strategic partner, partnership agreement with uh, India and an identical with the United States. And in turn, the two countries have you know, emerged as two leading strategic partners, as you discussed on this panel. So the question for the panel is, should and could the U.S. do more to help Afghanistan, regardless of the uh, spoiling estate that uh, the ambassador pointed out to Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, yes, yes, at the back. Uh, I'm going to try and compress everyone. Mr. Eikenberry, you mentioned, I notice in uh, kind of absolute terms, the increase in Chinese uh, military spending. Um, yet when you look at uh, Chinese terms as a percentage of, uh, of GDP and you consider their growth, uh, it's comparatively meager when you uh, Comparatively to, uh, to to United States uh, military spending and, uh, as a percentage of as a percentage of GDP, as we see this global economic order change, uh, what kind of uh, uh, military spending uh, is acceptable or, if you like, equitable um, on the on, on the Chinese front um, from the perspective of of the Americans, and what does that then mean uh, for for security in the region, and then? On the, on the ISIS uh, issue very, very quickly, and you mentioned the regional players. Uh, and you've also mentioned uh, this um, interdependent relationship between China and the United States. Uh, many economists would argue this is not so in terms of uh, the United States and, and Russia. And uh, those two powers that are arguably fighting uh, or at the uh, initial stages of the, of the um, conflict in Syria were also uh, uh, fighting a proxy war. Uh, we see the same thing in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, to what extent does uh, this whole idea of sort of uh, economic interdependence and international relations, is that instructive for perhaps security in, uh, in Northeast Asia and in this region, given uh, the emerging and, uh, uh, economic uh, interdependency comparative, uh, comparative to Russia, where we see sort of uh, two, two parties play arguably antagonistic uh, roles towards one another? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I give both you <laughs> questions, but I have to tell the panel that the answers will have to be very brief. Okay? <laughs> yes, sir, we will, uh, we will, will then uh, have it closed yes, off at 5.15 yeah. or 5 but I have to also get somewhere by 5.30. So, yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, my name is Roger Thuja. I'm a software systems and network engineer. Um, and I just have uh, an open kind of comment or I'd like to hear a reaction to the the incredibly surprising plummet of gold and oil prices over the past 16 years. I mean, not 16 years, excuse me, 16 months. I'll try to make mine very brief. Uh, I'm from, uh, you know, Delhi University and my question is addressed to Professor Sidhu. Uh, when you, you know, suggest that India should build global institutions to represent Indian interests, uh, what roadmap do you have, sir? Because, you know, I feel that the uh, global institutions that were established in the post-Second World War order, mm. you know, Bretton okay. Woods, UN, mm. so on and so forth, are so deeply entrenched with their, you know, with the seed costs and the investments, political and otherwise, that were made, that it's going to be rather difficult to have, you know, and to accept newer institutions. So, very briefly, what, sure. what did you have in mind? Sure. All right, okay, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, my question is... One uh, sentence. Okay. Uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Sir, that, uh, that, we, that we said that for economy to grow, we just not need the conflict in our neighbors, but also uh, world over. But uh, just pointing towards this, that rise of ISIS, that we said, uh, should not we promote the democratic uh, Islamist group like brotherhood so that they can contain or uh, they can 
uh, they can bring the things towards calm because if we are uh, pushing one group or killing one group and other group is coming, okay. we have seen it. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, professor. Uh, we have to really. Uh, the South Korean ambassador very aptly summed it up. He says, rise of India. Is rise of India being seen as a threat? Because with the Chinese president's visit to India, there were border uh, issues on the Chinese side. With the visit of the Pakistani prime minister to India for the uh, ceremony of the new government, there were issues. And also, uh, Professor Eisenhower, you mentioned that China's reluctance to use its influence over Islamabad to contain the issue of terrorism. So uh, are you saying that it is because of the rise, the threat of rise of India, and can the economic policies and the economic collaboration help in overcoming the will of the people, help in overcoming the contentious issues of security, terrorism? OK, thank you very much. Now, I have got the questions here, but I'm not going to repeat them. I'm going to turn go this way, if you don't mind. <laughs> Professor, which question would you like to answer? Uh, well, all of you can let your thoughts. <laughs> so very briefly, uh, you know, about uh, Korea's relation with the U.S., China, India. I mean, you know, South Korea relation with the India is you know, growing, but still it's not as you know, South Korea relation with the United States. I mean, China. I mean, either between China, no, between U.S. and South Korea, right? So, because still U.S. is in a major ally for South Korea, and very strong ties between two countries. So, anyway, so I just mentioned that. Professor Sundu, very briefly, I know. Uh, two specific questions, so let me address both of them. Um, the ASEAN process versus a uh, new OSCE. Well, I think the ASEAN process has, uh, you know, has been effective, but I think it's really reached its limit as well. Simply because you actually do not have very serious heavyweights there. And you need to have the major actors, uh, and you certainly Russia would be involved. But also, you know, uh, the way that uh, you know, I, at least I'm thinking of this: you cannot have an OSCE without the United States there either. They have to be there, uh, and that's how it's going to uh, work and play out. And I think then it would be a, a reasonable kind of balance between the various groups you talked about. Uh, I wasn't suggesting at all that India would entirely jettison the existing global order institutions. Many of them have served India extremely well and will continue to do so. So it's not, and India has been a good rule taker of many of those institutions and again will remain uh, so. In some cases what India is seeking when you talked about the Bretton Woods is tweaking it. And this is actually something that the G20 has suggested, but you know the U.S. Senate, in all of its uh, wisdom, is actually still holding back on some of those reforms going forward. So what you're starting to see is a BRICS bank. You're starting to see some institutions which are being coming out where you know they may, in the long run, actually challenge. And these are not being led by India, but they're being led by this frustration on not being able to reform existing institutions. What I was suggesting is developing institutions where none exist. There are no institutions today for cyber. There is no institution today for climate. Uh, and in all of those, you're going to have to need to have negotiations, uh, including India. And there, the role that India can play is that of a rule shaper. India alone will not be able to make this institution. It will have to play and work with other countries to shape the rules and norms and institutions in these new areas. Interesting. Ambassador. Well, I, I share uh, the view expressed about the size South China Sea. Uh, we're a big user. Uh, we don't have territorial claims. We don't take positions on the claims of others. But I think uh, for Americans, China's recent behavior has been disconcerting. They, they've ratified the law of the sea. But the law of sea, I think, uh, specifies that if you're going to draw lines on a map, they've got to be related to uh, land features that are real, that are visible at high tide. And the Chinese are actively engaged, as you suggest, in building up uh, land, land features that don't, are not visible at high tide, and perhaps for the intention of building airstrips. So what can be done? Well, I don't know whether uh, we can ratify the law of the sea in the next year or two. We made a big effort a year ago. It came to naught, I regret to say, even though all the military now support it. Yes. It's conceivable that Republicans uh, being somewhat more deferential to the Pentagon may pay some attention to that, but I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. The other thing I believe we should do, uh, 
The Chinese always complain that the, the so-called pivot or rebalancing effort is designed to contain China. Well, nothing involving the pivot or rebalance signaled, signaled a buildup of American military forces in Asia. It was designed to avoid a drawdown. But that was three years ago. In the meanwhile, the Chinese have increased their defense budget at more than 10% a year. And what we're, we're, what we're confronting, I think, for the first time is the fact that China, whom we got used to thinking about as a continental power, is becoming a major sea power. And as they project their naval power over distance at sea, their capabilities impinge more directly on our consciousness and our interests in maritime Asia and the interests of the maritime Asians and countries along Asia that have big navies like uh, India. So it seemed to me for the U.S., we need to begin building our capabilities, naval and air, in Asia. And if we can only do that by redistributing resources that are already in the Pentagon, we've got 40,000 ground troops in Northeast Asia. I don't understand why. So we could draw those down and put the money into increased naval assets. We ought to be more visible. And we can obviously provide, as others can provide, like the Japanese, for example, uh, Coast, Guard, uh, air, uh, Coast Guard craft and other capabilities that are relevant to the Filipinos and the Vietnamese and the Indonesians and others in Southeast Asia. So I think we should uh, do more for countries that are concerned. We should be more visible in a military sense. And we ought to call the Chinese on the fundamental conflict in their policy. On the one hand, they say we're peacefully developing. On the other hand, they claim indisputable historical rights to territory. And the, the methods by which they're supporting or advancing those rights are becoming increasingly muscular and implicitly coercive. And it seems to me while we want to engage the Chinese on things where we agree and we want to join with them in addressing transnational problems, we've got to show a little muscle when they are acting, I think, in a rather belligerent and